good old testaroni there. Um, that was good. So we got uh, today, we're going to be starting chapter 10. Chapter 10 is on parametric and polar functions. Um, this is probably the second most difficult topics here in this semester. But the good news is that after this one, I think everything that we do, at least in the non-supplemental things, are basically rehashings of things we did in Algebra 2. So things get much more familiar for a while unless we are able to get into the stuff that we don't always get to, um, which is good, right? Like get to some familiar stuff. If you felt good last year in Algebra 2, the next topics following this one should be pretty familiar um, where you'll see maybe a little bit of extension here or there, but largely you're going to see a reworking of some of these um, kind of fundamental algebra concepts with maybe a little bit more depth, but not too bad. It's okay? Cool. All right, so today, to start chapter 10, um, so this is, where is my, aren't we doing anything, pen? Ugh. Okay. Try taking the battery out and putting it back in. God bless you. Sure. You guys ever do that with your stylus just stops writing on the thing? Oh, yeah. yeah and then, like, you hover it over it, like, just screen. Sometimes you don't touch it, but it just hover yeah, it. it's still brightless. Yeah. Oh, boy. This is. Uh, really being a problem here for me. Mm. Well, let's try a little test. Well, it's not the stylus. It must be the OneNote. Splendid. Let's just try restarting OneNote. There we go, except this is chapter 10. So in chapter 10, we're going to look at parametric and polar functions. Um, basically, this chapter split down the middle where the first half of it is the parametric function part, and the second half is the polar function part. Um, so obviously today we're starting with the parametric piece. So let's talk here or like step back a little bit before we dive into parametric functions. And let's talk way back um, and remember what it meant to be a function. Who remembers the definition for a function? Oh, that's sad. Exactly. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, each input has exactly one output. All right. So it's a set of ordered pairs where each input from the domain has exactly one output from the range. Yeah, pretty good, Paul. So one what's one way that we detect whether something's a function or not? Yeah, vertical line test, right. So 
So for example, if we have something like the graph of a circle, we would say that's not a function, right? Under the way that we've been defining functions all the way up until this very moment. Everybody feels okay? This all sound familiar? All right. Here's the go, or here's the, the innovation here. What if I want to redefine how we do things so that we still obey this definition, but things like circles are okay? What would that mean we'd have to do? Paul? So it would mean you'd have to have, like, on the how you have, like, an X, Y, Z, you'd have to have something like that where, like, the circle could, like, flat along the X axis. That way, we do the variable line test, still a circle. Okay. Um, so, what if I add the requirement that this is still going to stay two dimensional? And we don't like it, try to project things into another dimension to get away with that. What if we do this? What if our set of ordered pairs contain some input, but our output is an ordered pair? So as long as my t's in this case are paired to only one point, that's still going to make the definition of a function, correct? Yeah. But it would allow me to create shapes like circles that would fail a vertical line test, but not violate the definition of a function. Because my input here, instead of being x, is this other parameter t. Is that make sense kind of and that's that's about right for what we've described so far so we're going to call this t a parameter so what we're going to do is we're going to use this idea to define what we call a parametric function so if for a parametric function we're going to define a function to give us the x coordinates in terms of t and a function for the y coordinates in terms of t and then we'll define t on some interval so this is what we call a parametric function these guys here we call parametric equations t is our parameter it's like this invisible third variable that's going to act as our independent variable and this interval that t is defined over is going to call we're going to call as the parameter interval Okay, so that's just a little bit of vocab so that as we continue to kind of explore this idea, I have a way to describe the parts to you and we can communicate to one another in a more effective manner. We haven't really done anything yet. I've just kind of proposed to you this idea, right, that we can kind of introduce this third kind of lurking variable that doesn't really appear anywhere in the graph but can allow us to generate shapes that would fail a vertical line test but still would be defined as a function because the output is now ordered pairs instead of coordinate, a coordinate, an x or a y or whatever. Okay, so let's look at 
an example here. So let's say we want to graph the parametric function where x of t is t squared plus 1 and y of t is 2t. And we're going to graph this three different ways, or I'm sorry, graph this over three different intervals of t. So this will give us three different graphs of the same thing. So we're going to use our calculator to do this initially to just kind of build up some intuition about what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to press the mode button on my calculator. Hang on tight. If you haven't already done so, I would recommend moving your calculator to radian mode, at least for today. And now, but previously we've been in this function mode. We'll also refer to this mode as like the, uh, or equations in this mode where they're like y equals yada yada yada. We'll call these like Cartesian equations because they're just generating points in the Cartesian coordinate system, like directly like X's and Y's. Um, we're going to move from that function option to the PAR option, which is short for parametric. parametric. Shocking. Okay. When we do that, if we press the Y equals menu now, you'll notice that our Y equals menu looks a little bit different. Right? So I have for one graph, see the slash there representing that graph? We have a place for the x of t and the y of t. If I press the variable button now, you notice that we're getting t's instead of x's because t is the independent variable in a parametric function. What's up? Will you do the A, B, and C, or stats, or Uh, neither. So this is the, the equation, the parametric function I've typed in. Everybody's okay with that? So I did one equation in X line and the other equation in the Y line. Every parametric function needs two equations. It needs an equation for the X coordinate, an equation for the Y coordinate. Both of those equations should be in terms of t. Is everybody okay with that? Now I'm going to press the window button. So in the window button, this is going to tell my calculator what values of t we're going to be considering. So for part a, we need to consider the values of t from negative 3 to 1. So the t min should be negative 3. And the t max should be 1. I'm not going to mess around with the t step at all. And the x min and x max are probably fine at negative 10 to positive 10. If yours aren't already set there, go ahead and reset them. But I, my suspicions are, since this would be probably the first time you're entering parametric mode since you've owned your calculator, that the window is already defaulted there. And now let's hit graph. So this is what we get. Notice, does this 
pass a vertical line test? No. Is it still a function? It's a parametric function. Yes, it can still be defined as a function. Notice before, were you able to create graphs like this with one line or with one equation in the Cartesian form? No, you couldn't create graphs that uh, didn't pass a vertical line test um, in the previous uh, in the previous mode. Drake, did I see your hand? So if I wanted to do part B, all I'm going to do is go back to the window, and this time I'm going to replace the T min with negative 1 and the T max with 2. And we'll hit graph again. Notice we have a different picture. Everybody's okay with that. And if I want part C, I just go back to the window. I change my coordinate, or I change my T min and T max. Hit graph again. We get this thing, different again. And if I wanted to graph this function in its entirety, wanted to graph everything, Basically, I'm going to just pick t min and t max to be kind of all real numbers. Um, I don't have to write in like something that large here. I think just going from negative 10 to positive 10 will fill the window that I'm looking at, give us a good picture of kind of what's going on. So this is really f of t in its entirety. And you can see those other three pieces were just like parts of this curve, right? You're just getting like an incomplete part of the graph. Is that okay? Kind of what we're showing you here in terms of what's going on. Okay. Um, let's do another one. So let's say that we wanted to do Let's say we're going to graph this parametric function. Anybody tell me what this is without actually graphing it on your calculator? You guys have all seen this before. It is the unit circle. Remember the unit circle, x coordinate is defined as cosine of theta and y is defined as sine of theta. Notice the values of t are between 0 and 2 pi, so this is exactly the unit circle. Yeah, let's type that in and just kind of confirm that for ourselves visually. So cosine t and sine t, and then we'll change our input from 0 to 2 pi. If you didn't change your calculator from degree mode to radian mode, you're not going to get a circle when you do this. You'll just get like, it'll look like just a tiny little itsy bitsy segment because it's just graphing from 0 to 6 degrees, which isn't giving you much of a unit circle. If you were in degree mode and you did that from 0 to 360, it would give you a circle, but it probably took a long time because that's a lot of inputs relative 0 to 2 pi. But it eventually would give you a circle, just like we got here. Itty bitty one. We could make the picture a little, we could zoom the picture in a little bit if we wanted to mess with the window and do like 
change the X mins and Y mins and maxes um, if we wanted to, but does that feel okay? All right. So we have this new way of representing functions, right? And we have this old way of representing functions. The old way we're going to call that the Cartesian form. And this new way we're going to call this the parametric form. And what we're going to be interested in here for the remainder of class is just translating back and forth between these two, which is kind of a natural first thing that we do in mathematics, right? We introduce a new way of kind of writing things that allows us to do some stuff that we couldn't do before or might make some things easier. But if we're going to rewrite something in one way from an old way, we want to be able to move back and forth between the two because... You know, that way we can take things that we did it the old way and find the ana the analogous way of doing it in the new way. Right? Kind of standard mathematical thinking. Okay. So going from parametric to polar is what we're going to start with first. I'm sorry, parametric to Cartesian. And the direction here is typically going to be eliminate the parameter is kind of the direction that we would give you. So here's our parametric function. And what we want to do is we want to rewrite this as a Cartesian function. Basically, you want to write as y equals yada, 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 with no t's in it anymore, right? Just y's, x's, and y's. Okay. So the trick here is we're going to start with the parametric equation for x, and instead of writing x of t, we're just going to write that as x. And then we're going to solve this for t. So we'll subtract 2 from both sides, and then divide both sides by 3. Oops. Everybody feel okay there? Nothing sneaky. Then we're going to take the parametric equation for y. And we'll rewrite that as y equals instead of y of t. And we'll substitute in our value for t. That we just found using the equation, the parametric equation for x. And then just simplify. Oh, sure. So I have one third x minus or plus one third. I 
Everybody okay to there? So that was not terribly complicated, right? Here's the tricky part, is I've given you this Cartesian equation, and if I look at this Cartesian equation, this just appears to be the equation for a line, right? Everybody should recognize that as y equals mx plus b. What would the domain and range for that equation be, or for that function? This should be trivial for you at this level. What do the arrows at the end of a line do? One, they go on forever in both directions. One should be pointing up and one should be pointing down. Everybody agree? Either it's doing this or this. So what does that tell you about the domain and range? They're both all real numbers, correct? That all the x's are covered and all the y's are covered? Everybody agree with that? Now that doesn't necessarily have to be the case here. Since we start with a parametric equation, we saw when we talked about this example up here that this gives us three very different graphs depending on the interval of our parameter. So we're going to have to think about this a little bit more carefully. So let's do the domain first. So domain is about which variable? The x. So I'm going to be using the parametric equation for x. It's evaluated on the interval from where t can be from negative infinity to positive infinity. If I think about this as its own equation, the domain for this equation is t, being all real numbers, and the range for this equation is going to give me all of the x-coordinates for my Cartesian equation. Let's write that down. All right? The output of x of t is going to be the x-coordinates in my Cartesian equation that I just made. That means then that the domain of that Cartesian equ equation is the same as the range on x of t. Is that okay so far? Does that make sense, that explanation that we've given? So if I look at x of t, what kind of function is that? This should be trivial, again, for students at your level. What type of function is x of t equals 2 minus 3t? Just take a chance, man. The worst thing that could happen is you're wrong. Shout it out. It's if like you... y is Good. It's a linear equation, yeah. right? Everybody OK with that? It's a degree 1 polynomial i.e. it's a linear equation or a slope-intercept equation or an equation for a line or mx plus b. All those type of answers are appropriate. They're all kind of saying the same thing. Great. 
The domain for that line is all real numbers. So we know that line is going forever in both directions, to the right and to the left. So does that tell me the range for this has to be? Also all real numbers. So we know that since the range of x of t is all real numbers, we know the domain of y equals one third x plus one third is also all real numbers. And that's the piece that we care about. So we know the domain here. all real numbers. Now let's talk about how we find the range. So just like the domain, the range is going to be coming from one of the parametric equations, but this time it's the parametric equation for y, because the range is all about the y-coordinate. So if I look at that parametric equation for y as a function, the domain for that function is given by my interval for the parameter, so the range for y of t is going to be the y-coordinates for our Cartesian equation that meaning the range of our Cartesian equation is the same as the range of y of t. Does that feel okay to everyone? Same idea so far, right? Okay, so if I look at that equation for y of t, what type of function is that? Still linear function, very good. And since the domain of that linear function is all real numbers, what can we say the range is also going to be? All real numbers. So we have that the range of y of t is all real numbers. <coughs> the range of our Cartesian equation is also all real numbers. And that's the piece that we really needed. So we would add on here to our answer above that piece, giving the domain and range for our function. Yeah, absolutely. So the natural question next would be, Mr. Kulik, seems like the interval for the parameter was the same as the domain and range. Is that always going to be the case? No. 
So let's look at an example where these things can be a little bit different and maybe get a little bit more complicated. Okay? Is everybody ready to do the next example? Yes. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions before I move to the next example? Okay. If we do something that I don't that you don't like or that you don't quite understand, please feel free to stop me. Okay, so here's our next example. And two things should kind of leap out at you as being decided, well, maybe even three things should leap out at you as being decidedly different here than the previous one. Can anybody identify one of those things? Great, so the parametric equation for y, we notice is not linear. So when we go looking for the range of that later on, that's gonna be different than what happened before. Good, what else do we see? Mia? Yeah, the interval is finitely long, right? That is, is just six units long from negative two to four. And what else do you notice about that interval? Yeah, one end is open and the other end is closed. Remember the end that has a parenthesis we call an open interval because if we're graphing that on the number line, it would use an open circle. And the one at the four, that end would have a closed circle. Okay. So that's kind of three new things that are wrapped up inside this problem. Everybody see the new things going on? We'll talk about how to handle each one of those things in succession here. Um, but we're still going to start the same way. So we're going to start by eliminating the parameter. So to solve for t, that's pretty easy. And we're just going to plug in our value for t into our parametric equation for y and simplify that down. Everybody good where the one eighth comes from? Uh, yeah, so negative one fourth times negative one fourth is going to be positive one over sixteen, and then times two gives you two over sixteen, which reduces to one eighth. Feel cool? So now let's start worrying about the domains. So the domain for y equals 1 eighth x squared plus 1 is coming from the parametric equation for x.
So just like before, what type of function is x of t equals negative 1 fourth t? Again, students at your level should have no problem answering this question rather quickly. Don't be shy. Worst thing that can happen is you're wrong. Nobody wants to be brave. It's a degree one polynomial still. Now it's a monomial, but still degree one. So this is just a linear function, right? There's no constant term added or subtracted from it, but that's fine. Still linear. Is everybody okay with that? However, this function does not represent a line. It represents a line segment because the domain is not all real numbers, so the line isn't going on forever in both directions, it's finitely long. It starts at negative two as the x-coordinate and it ends at positive four. Actually, be this way, since the slope is negative. Is that okay with everyone? So really what we're looking at here is a line that starts at negative 2 something and ends at 4 something. Does that make sense to everyone? So to figure out the range, all I really need to worry about are the endpoints on this graph, right? And just to be clear, this is a graph of t comma x of t, right? Because we're thinking about x of t as its own function. Is that okay? I just want to be clear because we're talking about like three different functions that are all kind of relating to one another. So it's very easy to get kind of turned around at what exactly you're doing. And if that starts to feel that way, stop me and we can re-explain where we're at. This isn't trivial what we're asking you to do. This is quite difficult. And it's quite theoretical because it's you're really having to use the definitions and understand like how these parts all relate to one another. Um, so if you get lost, that's okay. Just stop me and we can ask. Okay. So really all I care about is x of negative 2 and x of 4. Now, I'm going to put a star here next to the x of negative 2. Why do you think I'm doing that? Yeah, very good. So the interval where negative 2 is coming from is my open interval. And I need to make sure that I'm keeping that into account. So my range here for x of t is going to go from negative 16 to positive 8. But because positive 8 comes from the negative 2, and because negative 2 has the parenthesis, 8 is also going to have a parenthesis. Because the positive 4 has a bracket and the negative 16 comes from the positive 4, that's going to get a bracket. And I know that the range for x of t gives me the domain for my Cartesian equation. So I can just copy that into the space I left in my answer above. Everybody okay so far? Okay.
Now let's find the range of this. So again, the range is coming from the Y coordinate. And we'll start just like we did before. So if I look at that function y of t is equal to 2t squared plus 1, what type of function is that? Again, students at your level should be able to identify this almost instantly and should be comfortable with these names. It is not linear because if I note the degree on this polynomial is 2 because it's got a t squared, what do we call second degree polynomials? We have a special name for those. We spent like a whole chapter dealing with it last year. Starts with a Q. Quadratic. This is a quadratic function. What does the graph of a quadratic function look like? A parabola. Excellent. Can we tell whether these parabolas are going to open up or down just by looking? Yes. How, what part of the equation can tell me whether the parabola is going to open up or open down? Not the squared. The leading coefficient and the sign on the leading coefficient will tell me whether it's going to open up or down. Here our leading coefficient is 2, which is positive, so our parabola is going to open up. So we have, if we think about the graph, what could happen is we could have something like this. But comparing just endpoint to endpoint, is that going to get me the range? No, because we would have missed all of these y coordinates down here. Right? What other point on this do I need to worry about? The vertex. So, in addition to looking at the two endpoints, I'm also going to need to consider the vertex. Who remembers how to find the vertex of a parabola? This again this is something that we should remember. So the vertex of a quadratic function, f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, is negative b over 2a, comma, f of negative b over 2a. Hopefully that now starts to look familiar. I believe we spent some time with that last year. So in our case, what is negative b over 2a? Just 0. Is everybody OK with why b is 0? Why is b 0? because there is no b term. There's no linear term in my quadratic 
implying that the v value is zero. Okay, so we need to consider then y of negative two, y of zero, and then y of four. And again, I'm gonna put a little star next to the negative two. Um, I wanna point one thing out before we dive in and fill in the rest of this. I should check to make sure that that vertex is actually inside the interval for my parameter. Since zero is between negative two and positive four, I know I need to consider zero as a possible value for or giving me a possible, or giving possibly giving me a maximum or minimum. In fact, I know it's going to give me one of them. Um, if if that vertex or the x coordinate for our, I shouldn't say the t coordinate for our vertex was not inside the interval of the parameter, we don't need to consider it for this, right? Is everybody okay with that? What it would mean is that, like, we had something like this, where the vertex is not part of the parabola, right? Does that make sense? So you should check that as well, because that could happen. Okay, um, let's finish this up then. Gives me nine, one, and then 33. So how many of you say the range would just be 1 to 33, like that? What's up? OK, why? OK, but does that matter if the 9 isn't the smallest or largest number in the range? You're right the first time, Mackenzie, it does. Now, if these were all closed intervals, the nine doesn't matter. But because it's open, what's really going on is we have like, um, let's see here. Okay, so we have like, if I draw this, I have like um, negative two nine Oops. up here with an open circle. I go down to well to like zero one, and then I go up to like four thirty three. Ooh. Right, that's kind of what's going on here, right? I misspoke. Does the nine matter for our range? The fact that that's an open interval there? Yeah, because we have something over here that's something comma nine. Right? Can we see that? Is that sneaky or what, Mr. K? Or what? So I'm going to pause here and let you guys think on this for a minute because it feels like the faces that I'm seeing, there's a question that's going to be asked, which is good. Like, think about it for a minute. Ask your question or your clarification. 
process this out if you don't quite understand. We can re-talk through some definitions. And that's okay. <laughs> Well, that's this is the beauty. This is the this is the purpose of why we record them, though, right? Is if we're doing something complicated, and you need to look, work through the video to do the homework, that's the point, right? That's why we want to do this. Um, okay. Do we need to talk some more about what happened here? Okay. So the reason we don't. So the, the other option would have been, should we write it like this? So this is not what we need. And the reason is because here's a, there is a point that does use 9. right? The y-coordinate 9 is used once with an open circle, but then again with the filled-in circle. So there is a point that is using 9, even though it's open on the end point. Here, 9 isn't really used, but it does get used there. Because it's a parabola. Uh, will it always be open in a parabola? Here's where, here's where you could, here, here's, uh, not necessarily, but it's a small, a small case where that would not be the would not be what's going on. So if both ends were open, you're definitely going to have one of your ends here being one of your ends here being open. Or if one of the endpoints was open and also the vertex, then you would end up with an open at one of the ends. Does that, here, let me draw another picture, right? So we have some hypotheticals here off to the side. So let's say that our interval was this, right? And we have a quadratic. that maybe looks like that. So this is like T1, um, Y of T1. We'll call this point uh, XV and then YV for vertex. And let's say this is point T2 comma Y of T2. So here my range is gonna go from y of t2, which should be open, up to yv, which should be closed. This y1 being open doesn't matter because there's another point over here that has that same coordinate. Right? Can you see that, Mia? Do the pictures help? I think that's probably really helpful here. It's hard to picture it all in your head without the picture. Now, the other situation that we could have where we have just one end open is where the vertex is at one of the endpoints. So in this case, we have um, that is my scribbling getting too scrabbly you yeah of course you can always ask for like if things are getting hairy or you need me to just say what it is 
like I understand I have you know well maybe not terrible handwriting and can get it can get terrible especially when I'm trying to cram things into the side where I don't really know why I need it felt like I needed to do this all on the side but tell me if you need me to move here um, Sydney no I did it didn't I okay. Taylor I you know I, I don't I don't have any excuses I've had you two for two years I should be able to tell the difference but I still can't I know she's the one with the scooter but it doesn't help me when I couldn't tell the two of you apart beforehand like I get I understand one's with a scooter and one that's not but like if you didn't know which one was which anyways it's like okay scooter not scooter so I just call you not scooty then you know <laughs> She likes that She giggles every time I say it. I don't know if it's because she likes it or she hates it, but I'm going to keep doing it. Okay. She calls her scooter. Okay. Um, so does that, did that, Mia, did that answer your question? This was a pretty heavy hypothetical that we wandered into. Um, and basically, Mia was asking, is it always, like, would I never end up with an open interval on this kind of a question? And I wanted to point out that, like, I could think of two cases right away in which I still would. One case being fairly common where you have both ends of your parameters interval are open. And the other case where the open end of your parameter is actually the vertex. Um, could there be a third one? I don't think so. Nothing popped in straight away, but I'd have to really think, sit down and hard and make sure I run through all like the weird little counterexample things that could happen. This is all assuming that all we have is a quadratic also, right? You could have some other more complicated function where something else could be going on. But goodness me, let's not worry about that quite yet, right? Yeah. Of course. Okay. So, Mr. Kulik, this process you've described now is like that's just what we do, right? It could get complicated because we might have to find domains and ranges for these other pieces, but that's really as bad as it gets. There's not something else that could happen weird, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Actually, this isn't bad, but it's we have to approach it differently. We Okay, so here we have another parametric function where the parametric equation for x is 3 cosine t and the parametric equation for y is 3 sine t and t is defined on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Maybe we should say the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi to be specific. Um, so you might think, okay, I'll just do this the same way I did before. So if I do that, I divide both sides by 3, cosine t, and then I'll do the cosine inverse of both sides, and I don't like where this is starting to go. And then we'll plug it back into this one. And I end up with this, and like, oh, yucca rooskies. Like, what the heck does that even look like? I couldn't even come close to sorting the domain and range out for that thing. There's got to be a better way of doing this thing. Okay. So what would that better way be? Well, let's just look at the picture and get some kind of intuition about 
what exactly is even going on, right? So I'm going to just start by just graphing 3 cosine t, 3 sine t in my calculator. Um, the window that we just used from 0 to 2 pi would be is the same interval that I have here, so I didn't really have to change anything. I just had to update what I had in my calculator, and I hit graph. What shape do I have here? Look closer. It just looks like an oval because of the way my window is shaped on my calculator. Yeah, that's a circle because I noticed that there's three units this way and three units that way. So it's definitely got to be a circle, even if it looks like an oval. It's a mirage of my calculator. You can write Texas Instruments a nasty letter about how their window size should be symmetric, but so that it doesn't distort objects for you, but I don't know if they're going to respond. So it appears that this looks like a circle. And specifically, what about, what can we say about that circle? Ooh, from geometry, remembers the two things, that, two pieces of information we need to define a circle. Radius. Okay. Radius is one of them. No. <laughs> the center, yes. What's the center in this picture? Zero, zero. The origin, yes, zero, zero. Okay. This is good. Talk it through. Again, we're asking from old stuff. Some of you kind of remember parts of it, like team up together. You guys can work through it. There's a lot of good students in this room. You guys are very capable. Okay, good. Now, harder question. Who remembers how to transform this into an equation? Second. So if you're taking an ACT, that's one that frequently will pop up on there for you. But that's the standard form equation for a circle. So in this case, what would we say our equation should be for this circle? Well, x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals 3 squared, or just x squared plus y squared is equal to 9. Okay. Let's check this now. So we got that just from kind of looking at our picture on our calculator. So the x-coordinates are all coming from the parametric equation for x. So I'll put the 3 cosine, oops, t in for x, and we'll put the 3 sine t in for y, and we want to see if that does indeed equal 9. So what's 3 cosine t squared equal? That's just 9 cosine squared t, right? Let me do the same thing over here. Mm -hmm. 
and then everybody okay? What do you guys see now? How about a greatest common factor of nine? Oh, and Mm-hmm. What is cosine squared plus sine squared? One. One. And we have nine is equal to nine. So we're pretty confident that this is correct. Sienna? Yes. Okay. What we want to talk about next is going the other direction. So what if we want to go from Cartesian to parametric? This we usually say we want to parameterize the function or equation or whatever. So let's say we just have the Cartesian equation, y is equal to 3x minus 2. Is that meet the definition of a Cartesian function? Yeah, absolutely. If that's the case, then the parameterization is super easy. What's the independent variable in the Cartesian form? Well, it's x, right, is the independent variable. What's the independent variable in the par parametric form? It's t, right? t is our independent variable. So all I'm going to do is say that x is going to equal t. Then all I, can, all I need to do then is replace the x's with t's for y and whatever the domain for x was here becomes the parameter for t, or the interval for the parameter t. And since this guy was a linear function, I know the domain was all real numbers. Tyler? I didn't catch that uh, x t equals t. So the independent variable in our Cartesian form is x. The independent variable in our parametric form is t. So I just set them equal to each other. That way I just switched out all the x's for t's, and it's done. There's nothing really to do. Isn't that lovely? Right? That was quite easy. It's basically just a substituting the x's for t's. Mr. Kulik, that's what we like to see. All right, what if we want the parameterization, the line that passes through the two points? What if we want the line through, the, the parameterization of the line that passes through these two points? Well, there's the obvious thing you could do. You could use the two points to write your slope-intercept equation for the line and do the same thing that we just did here, or in the previous problem, right? Is there a better way to do it than that? Yes. There is. There's a faster way to do it than that. Not that that's a bad way, but there's a faster way. What's that faster way? Use the vector equation of a line. So if we remember the vector equation for a line, that's r is equal to r naught plus vt. Remember, r could be either point. It doesn't matter which one. I'm just going to pick a. v 
I'm just going to use the head minus tail rule. Good afternoon, Notre Dame. Before we reflect on the day, I wanted to make an announcement. Uh, the girls' cheer team is going to be heading to the state competition, so come to the gym right after school and help send them off. Go Irish! And now, let's take a moment and do a little bit of reflection. Do small sacrifices matter? Sometimes we think that we should try to do great things. Some may have ideas of grandeur and dream of accomplishing some great feats, but what about small, monotonous, daily sacrifices that we make? Sacrifices such as cleaning our rooms, doing the dishes, helping our parents, forgiving others, etc. Do the small things matter? Most certainly they do. They are a treasure we give to God like none other. Let's reflect on the small things that we do for each other today. And do some small things for other people this weekend. You have a great weekend, Notre Dame. Hey, can I have? Can I just have like two more minutes? I have one more yeah, thing I want to show you guys. I apologize. Okay. Um, what if we have the segment from um, negative one four to six negative three? Well, we'd want to do this the same way. We're gonna do our vector line equation. So I'll use my head minus tail rule. So I have negative one four plus negative seven seven T. So I can use that to form my parametric equation really easily. The issue is, though, that because it's a segment, my parameter for t is not going to be all real numbers like it was before. I guess we should write that in. We need to Sorry. get the okay. Get the parameterization here correct. The nice part is, since when t is zero. I'm going to get one of the endpoints automatically. I know it's either going to be 0, 1 as my t, or it's going to be negative 1, 0. All I need to check is to see what I get. So if I make that be 1, I get uh, negative 8 on top which is not what I'm looking for here. And if I try negative one, I get six, negative three, which is what I want. But it's always gonna be one of those two things. There's nothing to search for. Gotcha. That's where I wanted to end. You guys could be able to do 1 through 40 at this point. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. That would be due next Sunday. You're welcome. This coming Sunday? No, next Sunday, the 13th. For this Sunday, the only thing we have is the review from last chapter, which you've probably already done.